The other day, one of my coworkers spoke a classic line. We're on another Zoom call dealing with the coronavirus pandemic, and he said this, I just expect people to yell at me for no reason. When he said that quote, I grabbed a pen and I jotted it down because I think he's right. It doesn't take a really huge reason these days for people to lose it. And by it, I mean our patience and our kindness and our trust and our confidence and our love. Even for Christian people, it, it's been hard to keep our faith, to rely on God and live with the kind of peace that goes beyond understanding. Now, I'm not throwing stones here because I think I've kind of been in the same boat. A couple of Sundays ago, our church had a service and I was wearing my mask and trying to sing and I could just feel my faith shriveling up during the service. I was sick of the warmth of my own breath. Uh, sick of the smell of it, too. <laughs> I was trying to sing those Chris Tomlin high notes and they were killing me and the mask was sucking into my mouth. And I was just getting to this point where I was so over it. But then I remembered God. I had my journal with me in church and I remember writing down this exact quote, Mike, stop complaining and start encouraging. The service is about to be over and you're not going to help anyone just by venting and complaining. Remember to encourage people. They need it right now. But my personal pep talk didn't work. <laughs> by the end of the last song of the church service, my head was aching and my heart was as bitter as Passover herbs. And I remember seeing a staff member afterwards and I just, I vented. I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm done with this. And this was the first service we had. <laughs> uh, so how about you? As the coronavirus goes on and on and on and on, how's your faith? Can you relate it all to my story of, of struggling with the ins and outs, with the inconveniences and the masks and the mandates? Are you kind of done with this pandemic thing? I wish that you and I could just break up with Corona. I wish that we could make it Facebook official and post some picture of us with our closest friends, no social distance, hugging and rejoicing as if the pandemic were gone. But it's not. It's still here. It still shapes our lives and dominates our headlines. Which means that just wishing and just wanting and just praying, it might not be enough. You and I need to have a spiritual plan to how we're going to push back against this so that we don't lose our faith, our peace, and our joy. And that's why I'm so glad that you're watching today. Because this week, I want to give you essential truths to hold on to so that you can keep your faith as this thing goes on and on and on. And here's the first one. You ready for it? The first essential truth to remember during this pandemic is Jesus. I know. <laughs> Huge shocker, right? The, the pastor wants to talk about Jesus, but, uh, but it's true. 2,000 years ago in the book of Hebrews, there was a group of believers who were suffering intense persecution. And here's what the author of that book said. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. I really love those words. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I love that phrase, marked out for us. Think about that. Why are you and I living through this pandemic? Because God decided it would be part of our race. This difficult race of life that we had to run, we weren't born in that year or this year in that era of history or this one. We were born and we live right here and right now. This is our race. And it requires perseverance. The passage says, let us run with perseverance. <laughs> I don't know if you ever run around the block or done a 5K or a marathon, but as a runner, I can tell you there are so many times when you just don't want to run. When your brain is screaming and your body is aching and you just want to stop. 
And that's when perseverance is required. And this pandemic is the perfect time for that, right? We're, we're just done. We're just over it. Back to church, back to work, back to sports, back to school. We're ready to quit it, but, but we can't. We're still in the race. And so what should you and I do? These are the best words. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. If you and I fix our eyes on the headlines, we're going to lose heart. If we fix our eyes on the government and our governors and our leaders and their decisions, we're, we're going to lose heart. But if we fix our eyes on Jesus, we can run. We know that Jesus knows about this. Jesus controls this. Jesus forgives people like me when we lose it. Jesus is patient with us. He's kind with us. He listens to our prayers and he answers them. If we fix our eyes on Jesus, we have the essential thing that we need to get through this. I wish I could tell you how long this pandemic is going to last. I wish I could predict the date when we all agree on the perfect solution. I don't think it's coming soon. So let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let's keep running day after day, step after step with perseverance and love and joy. Let's not lose heart because we have God. That's the promise of Jesus. So let me encourage you today to fix your eyes on him and run your race. Let's pray. Uh, dear Holy Spirit, I pray to you today that you would help. It's easy to fix our eyes on the headlines or on the things going on in our world. So we really need help to fix our eyes on our invisible Savior. If we see him, we see love, we see hope, and we see the Prince of Peace. Help us to do that day, today for his glory and for our good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes I hate how clear the Bible is. Like this passage. The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians said, Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Well, shoot. <laughs> I gotta say, I wish there was some theological way to interpret that differently, but you get what it means, right? You don't have to have a master's in the Bible to know that do everything means do everything. The word grumbling isn't some obscure Greek or Hebrew word. You know what that means. And the word without is pretty crystal clear. When I think about the coronavirus pandemic, I think that might be the most difficult verse in the entire Bible to keep. Do everything. Without grumbling, arguing, division, or complaining, get through this with faith and with hope and with peace and with love. But I think what shocks me more than anything about that verse is thinking about the guy who wrote it and where he was. Some of you longtime Christians might know that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Philippians while he was under his own quarantine imposed by the government. He had been jailed for a crime he didn't commit and, and during his jail time, he wrote this book of Philippians. And here's the detail that shocked me. Do you know how long Paul had been quarantined? Years. If you would read the book of Acts after you're done with this video, you would find out that Paul sat in a jail cell for a crime he didn't commit, not for a few weeks or a few months, but for years. And then he gets around to writing this book, Philippians, and he drops this verse on us. Oh yeah, do everything without grumbling, complaining, or arguing. How did he do it? How is, how is that even possible? I haven't been going through the pandemic for years and already this feels impossible. So how did Paul do it? I think I know the answer. Humility. When you read about the Apostle Paul, you find a guy who was humbled by his own story. Instead of believing some of the things that we hear on Pinterest today that we're worthy and we're good and we're strong and we're brave and we're enough, Paul said to himself, I'm not. I've sinned. Paul spent the bulk of his life trying to make God love him by the good things he did. An insult to the actual goodness and standard of God. <laughs> and then in his religion, he was seeking to persecute Christians, even putting them to death. 
Paul knew that because of his sins, he didn't deserve anything. And yet because of Jesus, he had everything. Read Philippians chapter 4 and you'll see that Paul had found the secret of being content. That because of Jesus and his grace and righteousness, Paul was absolutely forgiven. So that even if he was quarantined in a jail cell, he had God. And that was enough. It was more than Paul deserved. It was better than what he should have gotten. Man, what, what a great lesson for us. Do you know what will really kill you during the coronavirus pandemic? A lack of humility. If you're absolutely convinced in your heart that you deserve better than this, that all of your school years and all of your semesters, all of your sports seasons and all of your job meetings, all of your weddings and family gatherings and funerals, if you think that you deserve that to go flawlessly without hiccups or interruptions, you're going to grumble and you're going to argue. You're going to grumble against God because you think you deserve way more. So what if you followed the path of Paul? What if you realized honestly that because of your sin, you, you didn't deserve much from God? And what if you realized that because of your salvation, you had the most important thing from God, his presence? What would happen to our grumbling if we realized that even during another Zoom meeting with a slight headache, another church service with social distance, that God was still with us? That we were still forgiven by God? That we still had the attention of God? That there's no pandemic that can push away the presence of God? Well, then if Corona lasted not just months, but years, we could be like Paul and rejoice and have a peace that goes beyond understanding. So Paul's words might feel impossible. Do everything without grumbling until you remember this incredible promise that God is with us, that God is here. We don't deserve much. We don't deserve anything. But God has given us everything because he's given us himself. Remember that, friends. Let's pray. Oh, dear God, you're with us. We see all these changes happening in our world and we're so tempted to be bitter and angry. And so we need you to open our eyes so that we could see the one thing that can fix it. You. That you're still here. And there's no mandate or decree that can change that. God, this world desperately needs people who live with peace and joy, who shine brightly in this dark and bitter world. So help us be those kind of people. We pray this all in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. That was my childhood pastor's favorite quote. As I sat in those little desks in the classroom in the church basement, my pastor beat that message of wisdom into our heads because he wanted to engrave it on our hearts. Like a dating couple etches their initials into an old oak tree. As we teenagers were entering that formative year of life, my pastor wanted us to never ever forget that friends shape our future. Well, it worked. <laughs> His words stuck with me after all these years. And I think they're good words for us to remember during the coronavirus pandemic. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Or I might paraphrase it this way, attitude is infectious. Have you noticed that just yet? That as much as we would love to think of ourselves as very independently thinking people, our attitude is so shaped by the people around us. That our closest friends and family, the news sources that we hear, the social media feeds that we read, have a way of shaping how we feel, how we think, what we say, and what we believe. Show me a person who spends hours, you know, sorting through the headlines, the debate and the inflammatory statements, the, the comment section where there's finger pointing and accusations and assumptions and conspiracy theories. Show me a person like that and I'll show you a frazzled child of God. But, show me a person who surrounds themselves with others who are slow to speak, 
and quick to listen and slow to become angry. People of faith who know that God is here and God is near and God knows and God controls, that God's got this. And I'll show you someone who looks a little bit different than the average American during these crazy times. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. So let me ask you an honest question. What kind of voices are you hearing these days? If you took out a journal and made a list of all the people who have your ear, all the news anchors and channels and sources and social media stuff that gets into your ears and eyes, your heart and your brain, what are you hearing and how is it shaping you? I want you to think about that as I share with you a classic passage from the book of Proverbs. It says this, Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Above all else, guard your heart. The author of the Proverbs knew what my pastor did. Your heart is precious. And everything you do, the things that you believe, the words that you speak will flow out of it. So let's guard our hearts. Let's not just let any bitter, cynical, accusatory voice into our heart. Let's curate our inner circle of people and news sources so that what we hear and what we come to believe is true and it's beautiful and it's right and it's good. So I want to offer you a challenge today. I want the wisdom of the Proverbs to be the thing that you let into your heart. When you're done with these devotions, if you don't have a personal plan, I would love for you to join me and my family and read the Proverbs in the days to come. You ever notice how there are 31 chapters? Sorry, 31. (laughs) I'm trying to think what it looks like from your perspective. (laughs) 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs, 31 days in the month. What if we took a chapter a day and let the wisdom of God soak into our heart? What if all these great passages about God and his majesty and his love soaked into our heart? What would happen if, if every morning God just filled up our heart with his truth reminded us about the power of our words and he shaped the very thoughts that we think. Well, then when this pandemic would squeeze us, what would come out of us is a heart that's been soaked in the wisdom of God. I want to challenge you today to do that very thing. You're you're going to hear somebody's words. Let's let it be God's words. Guard your heart. Everything you do flows from it. Let's pray. Father, uh, many of us have habits that involve hours and hours and hours of listening to people's words. We read, we listen, we observe, we, we soak them in and some of those things get to our heart. So we need your help to filter out what's good and true, what's right and beautiful. Let us to think about such things that we can find the peace that you intended our hearts to have. It feels like we need it now more than ever. So help us to guard our hearts well. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Leave it to the pandemic to show me how much I need Jesus. Now, I've been a Christian for almost 40 years now. And if my math is correct, I've attended over 4,000 different church services. 4,000. <laughs> I've read the Bible, not just a snippet here or there, but cover to cover time after time after time after time and you would think that I would get it. You'd think I'd be fairly good at it but then the pandemic came. I'm not sure if you can relate but no matter how long you've been following Jesus, whether it's your first day or you're 87 years in, it's been really hard to follow the basics. To love God and to love people. To trust God, to not give up our peace or our joy, but to know that he's here, he's got it, he's in control of it. And then to love people. To do everything without grumbling or arguing. And I think it doesn't matter how long you've been following Jesus, it's been tough. And that's why I'm so thankful for grace. This week we've been talking about those essential things to get through the pandemic. We've been talking about Jesus, we've been talking about attitude, we've been talking about wisdom. But I definitely want to end these talks with the biggest and best essential of all, with grace. 
So let me overwhelm you with a bunch of Bible passages. I hope you can think about them, meditate on each one, and find all the peace that your soul needs. I love this one from Romans chapter 5. If your sins have been piling up more and more and more since the pandemic began, the Apostle Paul says, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. And maybe you've given in to, to anger or to drunkenness as you've been sitting home alone or to lust as you've been frustrated and, and sitting online. But the Apostle John said, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Maybe you've been wandering in your faith. You've kind of gotten disconnected from God and from church and from the Bible and from your spiritual roots. Maybe you've wandered like a sheep. But the prophet Isaiah said, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. And maybe you think because of your struggles, because of your anger and your attitude and your bitterness that God's kind of sick of you and done with you. But the Apostle Paul famously wrote, It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. And maybe when you step back and look at life, you're pretty convinced that God is going to be done with you people and he's going to find some new people. But God said through the prophet Moses, The Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. That's grace. That's so good, isn't it? And through Jesus, it's all ours. So let's do our best to serve, to love, to trust. And at the end of the day, let's remember there's always grace and grace is all that we need. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, for many of us, the pandemic hasn't brought out the best in us. But it reminds us of the best thing about you. That you give shocking grace to people who just don't deserve it and don't expect it and don't see it coming. After all of our struggles and sins, Father, we wouldn't expect you to put up with us, much less like us and rejoice over us. But your word says that through Jesus, you do. So thank you for grace. Now may that grace compel us to live godly and self-controlled and holy lives in this difficult time. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, what's up everyone? Pastor Mike here from Time of Grace. Thanks so much for checking out this podcast. Uh, We certainly would love this message to reach more and more people. So if you wouldn't mind rating and reviewing this podcast, it would bring it to more people's eyes and we pray this message into more people's hearts. Thanks for your support and we'll talk to you soon.